Today we are pleased to have as our guest Stephen Bachelor, one of the mentors of secular Buddhism. We, that's Mike Slot from the Secular Buddhist Network, and Aida Duro, together with Saskia Graf from the Buddha Foundation. My name is Jochen Weber. I'm the co-founder of the Buddha Foundation in Germany. The Buddha Foundation is a platform and network for people who are interested in secular Buddhism and mindfulness. Today's topic is an evolving and exciting mindfulness course project called Mindfulness-Based Ethical Living, or in short, MBEL, MBEL. Stephen and I came up with this idea a few years ago at one of our study retreats. Many people came to the retreats with previous experience of some kind of mindfulness practice. But it became obvious that many of them were missing something in the long run for example, after having done an MBSR course. They came to the secular Dharma workshops to embed mindfulness more deeply in their living, especially as an ethical path for their own lives and for our planet. Which brings us to the first question to Stephen. How would you explain the ethical and philosophical foundations of mindfulness-based ethical living? <laughs> okay. Uh, well, thank you very much, Jochen. Um, it's a it's a very very big question. How would I present the philosophical and ethical basis of uh, Embel? Because they go back a long way. I mean, in many ways, the basis for this program is uh, pretty much everything that I've been involved in in my studies of Buddhism, particularly over the last thirty or forty years. Uh, Embel, I see really as the flowering of a 30 or 40 year process of inquiring into how do I lead an ethical life? How do I understand the kind of person I am, the kind of world I live in, which are on the one hand ethical, on the other hand, philosophical questions. And as that inquiry has uh, developed uh, over this period of time, uh, I find that my philosophy as a Buddhist has become increasingly secularized, that many of the uh, standard Buddhist uh, ideas that people would be familiar with, I've let go of, rebirth and karma and the Four Noble Truths and so on, um, have fallen away in this process and have brought me to what I feel to be a much more uh, a clear and, and focused and what most importantly, workable and useful uh, basis uh, of uh, a practical philosophy, which I think of as essentially uh, a practice of four tasks, which is very much central to the structure of mindfulness-based ethical living. Um, and those four tasks have emerged quite uh, explicitly from uh, the early Buddhist tradition although they're not referred to so much uh, in traditional Buddhist te teachings, nonetheless, I feel they tap into something which does not require any kind of metaphysical belief, that it is pragmatic, and it has at its core um, the question of how to live well. In other words, the four tasks, embracing life, letting reactivity be, seeing it stop, and cultivating a path or a way of life is essentially an ethical project. In other words, it's not a question of pursuing a practice, a meditation or a philosophy in order to get to what is ultimately true, but it's about finding uh, for oneself a framework through which one can lead a life in which not only one's philosophical and psychological insights are uh, further developed and explored but most importantly that whatever we do in our meditation in our thinking uh, for me needs to be uh, significant and useful in terms of how I then make choices in terms of what I think and what I say and what I do and how I live in the world uh, I feel feel that it's that kind of pragmatism that uh, characterizes this uh, ethical philosophy, as we could perhaps call it, uh, that 
we're now giving the name mindfulness-based ethical living. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen, for this elaborate answer. Um, <laughs> what distinguishes mindfulness-based ethical living, or in short, EMBL, from other mindfulness-based approaches, such as MBSR, MBCT, compassion courses? Well, uh, to the extent to which I'm familiar with those approaches, and I'm, I'm not a psychotherapist, I'm not someone who has ever used any of those uh, practices, um, is that MBEL is not primarily concerned with uh, addressing a pathology like stress uh, or anxiety or depression. And MBSR, MBCT in particular, are designed quite explicitly to be interventions in healthcare. Um, that could then expand, expand much, much further in the case of any particular practitioner. But MBEL uh, does not start from that premise. It's not primarily concerned with uh, healing a pathology. Uh, it's concerned really with seeking a framework within which to lead an ethical life that is based upon uh, the practice of mindfulness. So it's mindfulness based. And in that sense, it mirrors um, the uh, work of John Kabat-Zinn and others in MBSR and so forth. But because it has a wider reach, it's actually seeking to frame our lives in all aspects of our humanity and uh, not just our inner life, as it were. It seeks to incorporate uh, our relationships with the social world, um, our understanding of how uh, collective patterns of belief and opinion and behavior become internalized. Uh, they're not necessarily the sort of problems that Buddhism might speak about, uh, but issues like homophobia, racism, and so forth are for me just as central to this practice as greed and fear and hatred and so forth and so on. In that sense, it seeks to expand uh, and amplify uh, some of the same principles that we find in MBSR and MBCT, but to remove it from an explicitly therapeutic uh, context and to see it um, in some ways as um, a very secularized form of Buddhism that's got to the point where it's no longer requiring the reference to or the use of any specific Buddhist terminology. Thank you, Stephen. And what kind of skills are cultivated in the Ambel course and how can Ambel be helpful for your own life? <laughs> um, well, uh, again, there's a whole range of skills. It's not mindfulness is obviously a very central one. Uh, what we find in Embel though is mindfulness is 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 classified uh, according to the particular task it's engaged with. So we might speak of an existential mindfulness when we're embracing our situation. We might talk of a more therapeutic mindfulness. Perhaps they're more akin to. MBSR, MBCT, when we work on uh, coming to terms with uh, our own reactive patterns. We might speak of a more contemplative mind mindfulness uh, that is focused really on coming to dwell and coming to rest in a non-reactive uh, space. And particularly as we embark on a path, on cultivating a path, we can speak of an ethical mindfulness that is a mindfulness that's not just aware of feelings or sensations or mind states, but a mindfulness that bears in mind our values, that bears in mind uh, uh, what it is that we're trying to become as moral beings. Uh, so in other words, um, even when we talk of the practice of mindfulness, it's become somehow more elaborated than we would, might encounter it on, say, an MBSR retreat or a, even a Buddhist Vipassana retreat. Um, so in that sense, I think it uh, expands uh, uh, the basic practice of mindfulness, but it also brings into play um, 
a wide range of other activities that we would perhaps not come across um, as practices presented, say, in MBSR or, for that matter, in Buddhism. Uh, and I think particularly here of the practice of creativity, the practice of uh, cultivating the imagination, um, which are not topics generally thought of in the context of mindfulness. But it seems to me that um, if we're to think of this approach as an approach to our life as a whole, it means that we need to identify areas of our life uh, that perhaps we haven't paid sufficient attention to. Uh, in my own case, uh, that would apply, for example, to um, uh, to working cre uh, create creatively. It would also apply very much to opening up and expanding my sense of, of ethical engagement with particular issues that I might be concerned about in the world. Um, it would bear in mind the deeper questions of what does it mean to be fully human? It might also uh, you know, come to cultivate a certain sort of wonder or questioning or inquiry uh, that is not aimed at enlightenment or some particular uh, traditional Buddhist insight, but is simply a cultivation of the very essential human quality we have of, of curiosity, um, of um, a perplexity, of the capacity to look more deeply into the nature of what's going on, not just in ourselves, but in the world. I also feel that another practice that um, this then leads to is an, a, a practice of aesthetics. Uh, this may not be explicitly a practice of a particular art form, but nonetheless to be, bring into one's practice of Mbell, into the practice of one's life, um, a, a keener sense of what constitutes uh, beauty, what constitutes uh, sublimity, uh, to train oneself to attend to a whole range of human experiences that may not necessarily be found uh, simply in the practice of mindfulness itself. Wonderful. Thank you, Stephen. I mean, I, I think you really um, presented in, in sort of explaining how this approach kind of enlarges and expands in various ways the, you know, the, what, um, what MBSR and other the, the mindfulness-based modalities have been doing. I think you, you've given a really wonderful explanation of that. And I wonder, as you talked about the, the ways in which we can develop skills um, in a variety of different domains, as we become more mindful, um, how do you see this MBEL impacting on our contemporary culture and society? In other words, if we were to... Um, more and more people were to take up an MBEL approach to life. Um, how do you see that affecting um, our society and culture? That, it, that's a very good question, but one for which I don't have a ready-made answer. Um, I think all I can really hope for is what I probably hope for with all of my work um, over the years, is that when I write a book, I hope that that's going to somehow be of benefit to the reader and the reader will hopefully be impacted by it in a way that might make him or her, you know, have different ideas, new ways of looking at their lives. And that, you know, incrementally with, you know, with many people around the world reading the same material could have an impact. I think that in the long term, this could have an impact uh, simply through our becoming more attuned to communities of like-minded people who are committed to similar values, who seek to bring them into uh, their own lives. And I also feel that we must be careful not to be too uh, over-ambitious in this kind of regard, uh, in terms of seeing this as a a project that might help transform our society in some grandiose way. But to notice the fact that the impact of the practice of MBEL, in addition to oneself, of course, will first be felt within one's immediate surroundings, in one's family, in one's workplace, uh, with one's friends, with one's kids, 
and so forth and so on. And uh, I think from that basis, we can begin to recognize through the feedback and response we we get from others, uh, the extent to which uh, how we're living, how we're communicating, how we're acting uh, is having an effect uh, on their lives as well as our own. Um, I don't see Embell as something that stands apart from a whole raft of uh, parallel approaches that are developing now. Um, I think of something like, well, the, uh, some of the other forms of mindfulness therapy, uh, some, let's say, even the introduction nowadays of an interest in stoicism. Uh, again, it's a traditional philosophical practice, but one that's being refined and adapted to the current situation of our life. And I think it's together with such like-minded uh, groups that perhaps we can become part of an alliance uh, that might, over time, have a, an, an impact uh, that begins to somehow shift the way people think about what they're doing, uh, particularly ethically. I think it's important that we remain uh, conscious of the fact that this is about ethical living, and ethical living is not just about whether I you know, buy a certain product in the supermarket, but it has to do in the end with the sort of people I would vote for in an election, the kind of society that I would envision as one that would be uh, viable and uh, enable the flourishing of uh, people long after my own death. All of that has to be brought into mind. But as to actually giving a specific uh, answer that I would see this as leading to X or to Y or to Z, I cannot do that. Um, but I would simply hope to be able to trust that with good intentions, uh, with uh, resolve and commitment, that together we might open up a space uh, in which what we consider to be the essential goods of human life can be further developed, cultivated, and uh, articulated and shared in the wider world. I want to follow up with one, um, one issue. How do you see the relationship between human flourishing and ethical living? Um, there, you know, some people would, when they think about flourishing, they um, associate that with you know, kind of subjective experiences of happiness, well-being. Um, so in this, you know, in the MBEL course, we are um, talking about a way of life, which is meaningful and ethical, but also is one in which we can develop our human potential in a variety of domains. So how do you see the connection between flourishing and an ethical life? Well, um, as you are probably, well, as you are certainly aware, um, the 32 uh, virtues and skills that kind of form the main framework of this approach uh, uh, culminate with flourishing. Um, that's kind of where the whole project in many ways, uh, 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 that's how, that that's the term that we've chosen to represent, broadly speaking, uh, what this project is aiming at. It was a question of flourishing. But at the same time, I've also struggled with the word flourishing. I find it to be a very um, compelling idea. And of all of the various other possible terms we might use, I find that flourishing is the one that speaks most directly to me. When I feel that I'm really fully alive, uh, I feel that that's a moment in which my life is really flourishing. It's as though there's nothing uh, standing in the way of the potential I have to realize uh, my own possibilities. And so to that extent, flourishing is a kind of code for leading a life in which we are optimally um, realizing what we value most deeply. Uh, in lives, when we feel that what we're saying and what we're doing and what we're thinking and how we're feeling are all, as it were, in alignment 
they're all somehow coming together, working together. We've at least momentarily uh, got out of feeling you know, conflicted, uh, pulled one way here, another way there, and as a result, feeling kind of stuck. And that's an example of not flourishing. We're struggling. We're in a kind of stasis where we're not really flowing at all. So flourishing has to do with this sense of flow, uh, which is a psychological idea we'll find elsewhere uh, as well. Um, but it has to do, I think, with freeing up. Um, uh, it has to do very much with letting go of what it is that inhibits our flourishing. And in this model, what inhibits flourishing is what we call reactivity. In other words, uh, attachments and fears and aversions and opinions, all of which have the same uh, quality of, of, of trying to sort of hold things steady, to not allow uh, uh, change to really upset what we want. And Embel is very much about recognizing the tendency we have to lock ourselves into fixed patterns of thought and behavior, which although they might give the illusion of a certain security, have the negative consequence of preventing us from really feeling fully alive, mm -hmm. uh, from really being able to flow with life. So if we think of ethics as um, our capacity to uh, live our lives in a way that we become the sort of person we most deeply aspire to be, then that to me is very much synonymous with the idea of leading a life that enables us to optimally flourish. I don't see really much difference uh, between the two. Who do you um, think would be most likely to be interested in participating in an MBIL program? And, and would it be people who are who are moving away from traditional Buddhism? Would it be people who had been involved in an MBSR program and wanted something more? Or might it be someone who's just getting interested in kind of, a, you know, some ethical or spiritual philosophy and kind of looking around for something as an alternative to the current, what currently is being offered. So what are your thoughts about that? Well, I think the third category of, that you describe, <laughs> people who are basically sort of getting interested in these things and don't quite know where to go. I mean, there's probably a huge number of people out there, but very difficult to identify them. I mean, you can't, you know, there's not, they don't all meet together, you know. Please, all confused people, please uh, let's all meet up together and then we can figure out what to do. Um, so, yes, yeah, certainly, I think people of who are undecided, as it were, as to uh, you know how they wish to live and are looking for some kind of model of human life that might inspire them, then, yes, yeah, certainly for those people. But I think to be more uh, uh, practical here, the, the intent, the, the sort of people I have in mind, who would be drawn to this would be those who have already got some familiarity with the background. In other words, as you said, Mike, uh, people who are have been involved in Buddhism, whether they've been practicing it or whether they've just been reading a lot about it, or you know, there's a sort of they're, they're fascinated by it, but they're put off by some of the religiosity. They're put off perhaps by some of the things they're expected to believe, um, and they feel a kind of frustration. Now, these are the sort of people who would also be drawn to something like secular Buddhism, uh, secular Dharma. Um, but I also feel that there could be within that group people who would actually like to let go of the Buddhist baggage altogether mm. and who might be saying, well, why do we keep needing to refer to the authority of Gautama? Why do we keep having to refer back to these Buddhist texts? Um, and Embel has been is being developed precisely so that we hopefully retain the core values, the core practices uh, of the Dharma, uh, as the Buddhists call it, um, but without any of the trappings we might associate with either religious practice or with uh, 
um, holding certain doctrinal positions or beliefs. Um, and in that sense, yes, I think they could well find that uh, in Embell, there's a frame for them that would allow them to pursue in depth their interest in Buddhism, and yet without having to struggle with the elements of Buddhism that they find unacceptable. Mm -hmm. But perhaps the largest group might be those who have already established a practice of mindfulness through uh, one of these mindfulness-based approaches. Um, they may never have come across Buddhism, and in that sense could even be a big advantage in many ways. <laughs> They've got much less to unlearn. Um, and yet at the same time, and I think this is the great, you know, uh, this is really the great achievement of, of people like John Kabat-Zinn is they've introduced to a huge number of people who otherwise probably would never have come across these things to the practice of mindfulness. And when that practice of mindfulness is put into, uh, when mindfulness is put into practice, um, a lot of the people who do this recognize that it's not helpful just in dealing with my panic attacks, let's let's say, but it actually affords me another uh, starting point, another uh, perspective on my life as a whole. Mm -hmm. And I think it's for that sort of person who's grounded themselves in the practice of mindfulness, has got a, a practice, a daily practice, who kind of gets what mindfulness is all about. But as I hear repeatedly on retreats and in discussions I have, uh, they feel that they're left somehow stranded, that they've got this wonderful practice, but they don't really seem to have a context or a framework for it. They might even find that even the most secularized version of Buddhism still carries with it the aura of religion or belief that they're still not comfortable with for whatever reasons those might be. So Embel, I think, is primarily aimed at that community, at the community of those who have an established practice of mindfulness, who don't have much interest, if any, in Buddhism, uh, and yet who are looking for a philosophy and an ethics that will, uh, will help them not only to in a sense, further develop their practice of mindfulness, but to integrate the practice of mindfulness much more thoroughly in the rest of their lives. So that's what I would see primarily as the audience that I would feel would be perhaps most open to this kind of approach. Great, thank you. You know, I, um, Stephen, you you mentioned in the beginning that, you know, Embell is in some ways the fruit of 40 years of your practice, of your study. Um, and if you look at those 40 years, it's been quite a development in terms of your own perspectives. Uh, I mean, I remember reading Buddhism Without Beliefs and, you know, there, you know, it was kind of you introduced and made extremely popular the, the notion of beginning to, to question some of the basic beliefs in, in Buddhism and to have a more agnostic perspective, a more experiential, pragmatic perspective. And over the years, you've kind of continued to develop. And, you know, and, and on the way you've encountered uh, other perspectives outside of Buddhism that have become significant for you. And I'm just wondering in terms of as you look back over those 40 years, and the development, your development during that time, um, what stands out for you as a kind of motivation to continue to develop and to um, refine your thinking and even to, you know, question some, you know, very, you know, um, sort of uh, important and, you know, mainstream positions on these things. I wonder if you could speak about that a little bit. Okay. Well, first of all, um, it's not 40 years, it's 50 years, I have to. Okay. <laughs> uh, I, I started this journey back in 1972, which is uh, 51 years ago now. Yeah. Um, so it's a long time. It's my whole, from the age of 18 until now, it's all I've been doing. Yeah. And I often ask myself the question you've just posed to me, you know, what is it that drives this quest? What is it that I'm 
what, 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 what am I still looking for? Uh, and that's a question I actually find very difficult to answer, to be entirely honest. Um, because I think a lot of what drew me to Buddhism was not rational in the sense that, you know, I accepted Buddhism because it made sense and because I could accept its doctrines and so forth and so on. The reason I was drawn to the Dharma, to Buddhism, uh, was far more an intuitive thing, and it had a lot to do with actually the living Buddhists that I met in India at that time. I felt that here were people, not just, you know, great Tibetan lamas, but ordinary, you know, men and women in the Buddhist communities in India that I was part of. I felt there's something here that I really want, to put it crudely. I'd like to have, I'd like to be like them, almost as basic and simplistic as that. Uh, and I suspect for many of us who are drawn to Buddhism, it's often those kinds of encounters that actually are the, are the real spark that give us the, the resolve, uh, the confidence, the yearning. Uh, to pursue this path further. And so that's where I think it starts, really. And that and it continues that way, too. I find that I, uh, you know, what really inspires me to keep going is very often, again, encounters with, with people, with men and women from all kinds of backgrounds, not Buddhist necessarily at all. In fact, um, you know, I find more recently the figures who have inspired me in my work are not coming from the Buddhist community at all. But nonetheless, there is still that continuity, that's still that thread, this, this quest that's uh, driving me on. And I guess in some ways also, it has to do with, um, uh, with experiences that, have, uh, that, that I've had over this time, experiences that have somehow given me some insight into what this tradition is about, um, whether that's through meditation or whether it's through reflection, doesn't really matter. But in some ways, I think what has sort of sustained this quest is my practice of Zen, which I learned as a monk in Korea, which has to do with giving primacy to questions rather than answers. So in other words, um, if your quest into something is primarily driven by the hope of some result, some goal, some real enlightenment or something, um, you'll always be somehow, uh, in a sense, dazzled and I think uh, inhibited by this vision of what it is that you're trying to get. What I found in Zen is that by focusing instead on the primary existential questions, you know, who am I? You know, what is life about? And what is death? By staying with those questions instead of, and rather than trying to find answers, to actually begin to realize that the power of questioning is actually far more um, enriching uh, than coming up with some answer. And so in that sense, I kind of stopped thinking in terms of where this is going and instead have come more and more uh, to trust the, uh, the, the primary kind of uh, astonishment, uh, perplexity, amazement uh, that uh, for me, becomes more and more and more the heart of this practice, uh, to be able to embrace one's own uncertainty in a very radical way, uh, to let go of uh, the idea that one day I'll arrive at some insight or some solution to the world's problems. Uh, I think there's a great danger that by losing touch with the sources of our own confusion, our sources of our own ignorance, sources of our own astonishment, uh, that we can easily turn something like MBEL into another dogmatic system, into another kind of, uh, you know, quick fix solution to the world's problems. Uh, I don't see it that way at all. Uh, I see this as an open-ended quest. Uh, remember that quest, question in English are the same root. Um, I see it as an open-ended quest to 
be more interested with the by the the challenges and the and the puzzles and the conflicts that arise as we proceed rather than always trying to somehow see ahead to some final outcome that lies there just at the end of the rainbow as it were um so thank you stephen um Ambel has a framework um, and, and you, you call these the four tasks and you call them ELSA, this acronym ELSA. Um, ELSA is a practice of care, you say. Mm. And the whole course, Ambel, is, is kind of, it's about ethical living, but it's very much about care. Would, mm. you, would you like to say something about this word care and, and the, the relation to Ambel? Okay, well, um, I'm glad you brought that up, Ida. Um, care is a very, very central idea. It's not a not even a central idea. It's it's the idea that contains the whole project. It's a very inclusive idea. Um, the and in fact, I think we could we could speak of Embel as an ethics of care which is a term that's not my own. Uh, there already exist uh, ver versions of an ethics of care. Um, but uh, care, uh, I mean, I use the word care as a translation of a, a Buddhist term, apamada, which is often rendered as diligence or heedfulness or something. But I think the word care captures it rather well. Um, from a Buddhist perspective, uh, the Buddha describes care as the elephant's footprint. In other words, it's the footprint, the largest footprint that you'll come across in the jungle. And into that footprint, you can put the footprints of all the other animals. And in the same way, the Buddha understood care as the virtue that includes all other virtues. And that's very much the starting point for my understanding of care. I've expanded it by referring to other traditions, but at the root, that's where the heart of it lies. And I understand the four tasks, or ELSA, as you mentioned, embracing life, letting go of reactivity, seeing it stop and acting. Uh, I see that as basically a phenomenology of care. In other words, if you were to ask, you know, what is care made of, if we could pull it apart, how would, what would it look like? What are its structural features? Then I would argue that its structural features are the four tasks. The, the to care in the fullest sense for another person, or let's say the, to care for the planet, means that in the first instance, we need to be able to embrace what we care for, to be able to fully accept, maybe understand what we care for. The next step in care is to uh, is to take out of the experience one's own uh, self-centered, egotistic, uh, reactive patterns. To, so, so in other words, to let that reactive, those reactive patterns just be, not to you know, suppress them or get rid of them, but to not let them run the show. So to care means to be less reactive, maybe non-reactive. And to cultivate that non-reactivity, to, 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 to learn to find within the core of one's own heart um, a non-reactive space, a nirvanic space. Uh, that is also a dimension of care. It's the depth dimension of care. In the first instance, it's the way that we most deeply care for ourselves. In other words, to allow ourselves to, to be at peace to be at ease, uh, to stop all of the chatter and the habit, to create and to refine a space um, in which we are still, in which we are well, and in which we touch a depth in our lives that can also become a source of our care for others. So the fourth task, that of cultivating a path, is essentially a way in which we extend the principle of care into caring for ourselves, for others, for the world, in terms of how we think, in terms of how we imagine, in terms of how we speak, in terms of how we work. These all are then seen as, uh, 
and as, as frameworks within which to become a more caring kind of person. And ultimately, I think, um, I think it's about working towards creating a more caring society. And to think of care, not just as a spiritual quality, but to think of it as, as, a, as a form of work. And we often don't really value the work of, of carers, you know, doctors, nurses, people who do all kinds of things that, you know, taking out the garbage and stuff. These are all people who are allowing our society to be the way it is with all its conveniences and its uh, good things and bad things too, I suppose. Uh, but there's a, a level of care in which we, which, which we perform simply in being good citizens good mem members of our community. So care is an incredibly rich idea. And I'm, I'm very, you know, I'm very concerned that it remain very much in the forefront of how we understand uh, this practice of MBEL. It is the practice of care in that deepest sense. First format, we don't give any answers, but uh, we try to um, teach questioning and exploring and um, giving all the participants the chance to um, learn from themselves. So um, this pro process uh, of creating is still ongoing and we hope uh, within the upcoming month we can, um, well, give it away and um, uh, offer it to the world. So thank you very much. Well, thank you so much, Jochen. And likewise, Ida and Saskia and uh, and um, Mike, and of course, all of the others who have been involved in these different working groups. I'm, I'm very touched that uh, uh, so many people are sacrificing and giving time and energy to this project. And let's hope that it really comes to fruition in a way that can benefit uh, even more even more people in this world. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen.